present uh, two different perspectives. So Saptarshi's had, I guess, more of a very uh, directed path where he's continuously excelled and worked in the area of controls and robotics and has reached the status of a subject matter expert at GPL. Whereas I have kind of, um, I've been kind of like bouncing around in a few different areas and eventually made my way into robotics at JPL. So hopefully you'll find this comparison uh, slightly helpful. So uh, Anmol gave a background about me, but I'll maybe go a little bit more into the depth of it just to show you how I basically ended up at JPL. So as he mentioned, I did my bachelor's in ET in engineering physics uh, from IIT Bombay. And what I wanted to emphasize was that, uh, as he mentioned, I was the overall coordinator of technique, which used to be the precursor of STAB, which I understand is the precursor of ITC. Uh, and not just as a part of technique, but in general, like when I was at IIT Bombay, like participating in the events organized by the electronics club, the, the astronomy club, Kritika, or the, all the events at TechFest or the aeromodeling club, uh, or the math and physics club, they were like a really big part of my existence over there. And I really owe a lot of what has happened in my career to the experience I gained by participating in these events. Like I still remember when I came in my first semester at IIT, like my, all my knowledge had been like completely bookish. So I didn't even know how to like light up an LED. Like I remember I was like blowing up LEDs in my hostel room because I didn't know I need to put like a series resistor whenever I try to like, uh, provide voltage to an LED. And even with uh, motors, I just didn't know how do I reverse the direction of a motor. Like I didn't know any of these things. And, but I participated in all these events and formed like a really good group of friends and a community, which really inspired me and gave me the confidence to like learn things which I would otherwise not have learned in my curriculum. And just for funds, I was like going through like really old, 10 year old emails today. And I, uh, tried to put together a collection of all these posters from events that we had organized back in the day. Uh, I don't know, I don't know how embarrassing this sounds right now, but, and this is probably not true anymore. You probably don't have these crazy posters being put up in hostels because you now have mailing lists and better ways of communicating. But back in the day, we still used to popularize our events by putting up posters in hostel notice boards. And the brighter and more like appealing your poster, the more attention you draw towards your event. So I was just like going through all these like old events that we had organized. But anyway, I was, all I was trying to say here was it really helped me uh, kind of expand my horizons while I was at IIT. And I would say like the culmination or like the pinnacle of that was basically the uh, student satellite project at IIT Bombay. Uh, so this was a project that actually Saptarshi uh, started or Saptarshi was one of the people who started this project at IIT. And it really had a big influence on me. You can see I'm in this picture over here and Saptarshi is in this picture over here. Uh, just the idea of like working on something that's going to go into space, uh, building something that's going to fly in space and the whole process interacting with the scientists at ISRO. Uh, I was just so enamored by it. I loved it so much that I decided that I'm going to do my a PhD in aerospace engineering. So, after IIT Bombay, I switched to a PhD, a master's PhD program at Stanford University, where I majored in dynamics and controls. Um, and I did my PhD on uh, the detection of meteoroid and orbital debris particles in space. Uh, and after I did my PhD there, I went to Caltech, where I did a postdoc. Um, and I worked on a couple of different projects over there, so more in the aerospace area. So one of them was on this idea of uh, doing trajectory design or designing the trajectories of a constellation of satellites or a collection of satellites that can collect solar power in space and then beam it to a receiving station on the Earth. And simultaneously, I was also working on this other project here where we were trying to do a flight demonstration of this idea that you can launch multiple individual mirrors in space and have them assemble in space to form a much bigger telescope than what you could have launched in a single launch vehicle. So these were some of the projects that I worked on uh, during my postdoc. And while I was actually doing my postdoc and uh, while doing my PhD, actually, there were a couple of uh, other independent ideas that I was working on. Uh, so we formed a couple of companies in the Bay Area and started pursuing some aerospace related ideas through those companies. So I'll quickly briefly mention uh, the two of them. 
So the first one we call it night crew labs and we call it that because we all had day jobs and so this is something we were doing late in the evenings in standard iit style um so what we, we basically started off as a group that just wanted to launch high altitude balloons for fun and we put like some fancy cameras on them and took some really cool pictures uh, so this is like a campaign we did over san francisco and got some pictures and then we even went to alaska and took pictures of the alaskan landscape and the aurora borealis in the, in the winter uh, but then a couple of years ago we actually started realizing that we have a really good platform to do some really useful science and so what we've started doing recently is uh, uh, so when you have these gps satellites setting on the horizon uh, their signal passes through the atmosphere before it reaches you and while going through the atmosphere it actually bends in the atmosphere and it bends by a very small amount like almost like 1 milli radian or one micro radian and this picture is really exaggerated but you can actually measure this amount of bending and by measuring that bending in the signal you can actually infer the temperature pressure humidity in the atmosphere and this is like really valuable data that uh, scientists can use for improving their weather models and predicting and improving their predictions of uh, weather events so we've been doing this for the last couple of years we've launched about 20 different balloons and we've been collecting data that we provide to NOAA which is like the US agency that's responsible for weather forecasting. And the other, uh, I guess, endeavor that I've been pursuing for the last one year, we, the company is called Zona Space Systems. And this is kind of related to, or at least the, the technology is kind of related to what I mentioned on the previous slide. And here the idea is, uh, so we have the GPS satellites and they are, they've been there and they're very good in what they are doing for us. We believe they are not sufficient to meet the future requirements of autonomy or the autonomous systems that are going to come on board. So with all the autonomous cars and systems where your life starts uh, depending on the accuracy, robustness uh, of the GPS signal or the robustness of the position information that you get out of the GPS signal. So we believe we need something which is more robust, more precise, and less uh, susceptible to getting spoofed or jammed by some bad agents in the system. So instead of using satellites in medium Earth orbit, which is where all the GPS satellites are right now, we are planning to launch satellites in a low Earth orbit. Uh, so these are, in, so medium Earth orbit is around 20,000 kilometers, and we are planning to launch satellites in around 700 to 1,000 kilometers. And the, there are multiple advantages to this. Uh, one, you can, your signal strength will be much stronger, so it's harder to jam the signal. Uh, also, we can encrypt our signal, which is something GPS does not do. And that prevents people from actually uh, kind of spoofing our signal. And the third big advantage is like something which might not be easy, very easy to understand. But the idea is that when you do triangulation from your multiple satellites, the more geometries that you can triangulate from, the better is your solution. And what happens is a low Earth orbiting satellite kind of moves faster in the sky than a satellite which is in a medium Earth orbit. So because the geometry changes more rapidly in a low Earth orbit, your solution that you get out of this is actually more, uh, is more robust. So those are some of the side projects that I've been pursuing, but maybe for the rest of the time, I'll just quickly talk about what I've been doing at JPL. Uh, so I joined JPL about two and a half years ago, and I've been working in the robotic section over there. And to motivate the project that I've been working on, and uh, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we call ocean worlds uh, or icy worlds. So these are basically moons of Saturn and Jupiter, which are known to contain uh, an ocean of liquid water beneath their surface. So on the left over here, you see a picture or like an artistic rendering of uh, Europa. And on the right, you see one of Enceladus. So Europa is a moon of Jupiter and Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. And we strongly believe that there is a big ocean of liquid water under the icy surface of both these objects. And since the presence of liquid water is associated usually with the presence of life, like it's a high priority for NASA to go and explore what's happening in these oceans and sample the, the liquid over there. And so, um, so these are some of the properties of these two objects that I've listed over here. Like one thing I wanted to highlight is the acceleration due to gravity on the surface. At Europa, it's like just 
1.3, which is significantly lower than the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth, like more than seven times smaller. And on Enceladus, it's actually just 1% of Earth gravity. And this poses like some significant challenges for us when we are trying to design robotic systems and robots that can go and do our exploration on these objects in the solar system. So this is, uh, so since this is a high priority for NASA, they have come up recently with what they call like a reference mission concept. And so the the exploring an object like Europa or Enceladus is actually very challenging. Uh, so if you take Europa, for instance, because of how far Jupiter is from, this, from the sun, you only get about 4% of uh, solar power than what you get uh, near Earth. The ambient temperature is as low as 96 Kelvin, and the radiation background is almost 30 times worse, or like this, 30 times more intense radiation in Europa because of Jupiter's magnetosphere than what you experience in Earth orbit. So, uh, because of all these complicating factors, we believe that given the budget constraints, we can only have a mission last for a duration of 20 days on the surface of Europa. And the amount of time it takes for a signal to go from Earth to Europa and come back, it's on the order of like, actually just the one day time is on the order of 33 minutes to 53 minutes. So when you have a mission that lasts only for 20 days, you cannot really afford to, you know, like send a command, look at what happened, then send the next command and then look at what happened. That's just not possible. I mean, that's how we operate all the Mars rovers right now, but that paradigm is just not going to work for exploring these ocean worlds. So we know we have to do things autonomously, like things, intelligent decisions have to be made on their own. So the robot has to automatically select the optimum site for science investigation. It has to deploy its instruments, collect samples, analyze them, detect any faults that may happen during the process, correct them and do all of that on their own. And to develop these technologies that will help us achieve this, uh, the goal of my project is to develop or build an equivalent lander on Earth or like a, a test bed for such a lander on Earth where we can test a lot of these processes and these phenomena that we are interested in. So this is actually the test bed that I've been working on and that we've developed in the lab. Uh, so on the left here is, this part is called a steward platform. It's basically a six degree of freedom robot, which uh, can move in X, Y, Z, and it can also uh, do roll, pitch, and yaw. So it has complete six degrees of freedom. So that's kind of representing the body of the lander. And then we have attached to it like a seven degree of freedom robotic arm. So this is the arm that will go collect some samples and do some investigation and things like that. And so this arm is kind of very similar to a human arm. Our human arm can be approximated as a seven degree of freedom arm as well. And we have a bunch of cameras, motors, and we have a, surf, uh, a bin where we put the material which is representative of the type of material you find on these objects in the solar system. And uh, the idea is that we really want to recreate the low gravity conditions that you experience in Enceladus and, and Europa. Because what would happen is, even if you try to just scoop some sample, it might seem very counterintuitive, but you might actually completely flip your robot over because of the low gravity. The reaction force and the moments created by you just interrogating the surface can cause your entire system to flip over. And typically when you want to simulate these low gravity environments, you use techniques like you build some sort of a gravity offload rig, or you use zero G flights, or you like build some sort of an air bearing kind of a system which can offset some of the gravity. But none of these are really suitable for doing really true low gravity environment simulations for long sustained periods of time. And so what we have done with our platform is we've actually uh, done everything using control techniques and in software. So we just run our loops and other techniques in, at such a high rate that we are able to mimic the response of a system in a low gravity environment without having to do any of these uh, fancy like complicated gravity offload systems and things like that. There are a lot more technical details, but it's, I think the goal of this talk is not to necessarily make it a very technical talk. So I just wanted to give you a flavor of the different types of things I've been working on. And this was just my last slide. I just wanted to end on like a little bit of perspective on what robotics is like. Uh, so I've listed like some of the areas which are considered kind of critical in the field of robotics, like important skill sets which are useful in the field of robotics is estimation and control. 
how do you like acquire data from sensors that have some error in them and how do you combine data from multiple sensors motion planning or trajectory planning computer vision which has become a really important aspect of robotics or perception systems and then machine learning is being used very very heavily in many many different ways in robotics these days uh, and some of the classical fields like dynamics and motion simulation and in general like it really helps to have good hardware skills like good mechanical and electrical engineering skills if you want to work on on physical robots so you can see that what i'm trying to highlight here i guess is that it's a very very multidisciplinary field like when you combine knowledge from all these different fields you end up with applications like aerial robotics robotics in extreme environments like underwater or 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 space robotics uh, multi agent systems that saptarshi will actually talk a lot about or these autonomous systems and autonomous cars all these different application areas use a combination of these skills and we need people from mechanical engineering electrical engineering computer science aerospace physics many many different backgrounds to contribute to make a robotic system possible like robotics has a very very broad definition these days and that's why someone like me from a more physicsy background was also able to find a role and a place in the field of robotics so i just wanted to highlight that you know it's especially i believe that in our system in india during undergrad we are kind of pigeon holed into believing that oh like i'm in this department this is kind of my destiny but trust me like you really only scratch the surface in your undergraduate career you the goal is to just uh, gain enough strong fundamentals that you can then go on and apply them to many many different fields in the future so i think with that i'll i'll stop here and pass it on to sapashi if someone could send the ball my way i think the host has to do it because i or okay uh, yes it's the presenter privilege right yep you guys can see my screen now yes yes we can see um so hi everyone i'm saptarshi bandopadhyay uh, my name saptarshi literally means the big dipper constellation so i've always been kind of an astronomy fan and this talk is about how i ended up in space robotics which is not exactly the same thing but quite close um i work as uh, just like ashish well i work at jet propulsion lab caltech which is a nasa center uh it's a it's a complicated history you should check it out in on jpl's web page i'll know but it's it's a quite a fun story uh in jpl i work in the multi agent and maritime autonomy group where we specialize in multi agent systems and that is what i've been doing my entire life uh so about me uh i like astronomy as my name says uh, and so i was part of the national astronomy olympiad team of india and i won a bunch of other interesting scholarship during my pre iit bombay days i also had the chance to do a lot of uh, astronomy research thanks to a very good astronomy program across india and uh, here are some examples of ro of uk you know giant mint gmrt is a very awesome platform that we have in india and i did some research there looked at studied some exoplanets at a uh, venuba observatory in kavlur and then i also spent some time looking at coronal mass ejections at aries so very deep interest in astronomy but as luck would have it in when i joined iit bombay i had a i had a grant which allowed me to only get into aerospace engineering so i was like what will i do right and so but now that i was in aerospace engineering in iit bombay i was like you know astronomy and aerospace are not that far away so maybe let's give it a try and this is one of the things that uh, surprises me in india that uh, we don't see this anywhere else in the world where you're kind of pigeon holed into your engineering discipline right at the beginning when you really don't know what you're doing and it's a luck so i strongly second second what ashish said that you have to find your passion and then find a way to that passion because just because you happen to be in a certain discipline at 18 years of age is not the best reason why you should continue in in my case i was very lucky because astronomy and then aerospace 
I happened to be very close. I also was doing a lot of robotics during my undergrad time in, uh, in India. Uh, I'll just quickly go to the next slide where around 2007, Shashank Tamaskar and I uh, were the ones who started, but there were a lot of others who were very instrumental in this. People like Varun Bhalera, who is now a professor at IIT Bombay, uh, Shrihas Tendulkar, uh, my, uh, my wife, Haripriya, was, uh, was also doing her PhD in US, so doing a postdoc in US now. A lot of people who built this idea up, I know we, we often get stated as the co-founders of this, but you know, people like Ashish and Haripya and all have also played a massive role in making this project, starting this project and subsequently leading this uh, project to a success. I spent the first four years of uh, my pro of this project time as a project manager and systems engineer in IIT Bombay. Uh, we built the satellite. Uh, we thought when we started, we thought we'd launch it in like two years, but subsequently, you know, reality struck and we realized how complex this this uh, these problems are. But we did manage to launch in September 2016. It was a great experience, this entire thing. But it's kind of whetted my appetite to what space exploration is like or what we could possibly do. The goal of this project was to measure total electron count, which we, which we haven't been able to measure with the satellite as of date. We might someday, don't know. But overall, that whetted my appetite to do a PhD also in uh, aerospace. In particular, in aerospace, I wanted to go deeper in controls because I really like uh, math. And so I started doing a PhD at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign on control theory. Uh, and in particular, I wanted to do multi-agent systems in control theory because I have this fascination that, you know, 50 years from now, we'll see this, these drones or these flying cars roaming around the world and everyone would be like you know, chilling at their house and, and not having to worry about things like transportation or things like carrying, you know, people from point A to point B. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a futuristic world that, you know, many futuristic uh, books like uh, Foundation series or movies like uh, Minority Report paid. And I would want to be a player in enabling that future. So that's, that's the goal I have. I don't know if we'll reach there. I hope we do. I don't know if humanity will survive till then. I hope we do. But point is, at least that's the vision that I started off when I was in IIT and I wanted to enable during my PhD, I came across a lot of work that we do in multi-agent systems and so on say, for space research. And that's that's where I, after my PhD or during my PhD, I worked on swarms for space, you know, for large numbers of spacecraft. And uh, after my PhD, I started off as a postdoc. I did a bunch of summer interns at uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Then I did a postdoc over there for a for a year, and then I became a Robotics. I was. I really wanted to get in there, so I just kept going back there every year. Um, I'll show a, a, a brief idea about the kind of research I do to, to motivate how I went around in this uh, area. My main skills are mainly in these three areas: control theory, graphs and networks, and probability theory. Uh, so you could think of probability theory as score math. So people who are doing math today would really attract it. Control theory is more of an applied math, if you like. And then I apply these two really heavy mathematical skills along with all the all the aerospace background that I have uh, for networks problems. So that's where the graphs come in. And I, I work on a large number of applied worlds. I don't actually do pure science right now. So a lot of these topics like estimation theory, optimal transport, nonlinear control, uh, this plain aerospace systems and robotics, GNC of multi-agent systems, synchronization and consensus, probabilistic swarm guidance, Markov chain, distributed estimation. These are all problems that exist in different sections of this uh, knowledge Venn diagram, if you like. Uh, so here is an example. Oh, before that, let me just talk a little bit about why robotics is important and why we envision this to be a very, why I envision this to be a very important field. Um, automated machines have been around for quite a long time. This is Shannon talking about his uh, micro mouse uh, in 1950s. And uh, then what we see today is automated factories. So these are all still large number of robots, but um, what we, so what do you would expect next from all these things? You would expect that industries like manufacturing, mining, transportation would be completely automated in our near, near future. And 
Why? Because not just robotics has uh, has as a as a as a discipline has increased. There are also a bunch of other disciplines that are really helping robotics increase. They become very valuable, and one of them is control theory. So here is a chart that shows the different large contributions in control theory over the last century, and you would see like. You know, right now there's there's not much left on this end other than applying them to really large multi-agent systems. That is what we are doing now, or applying them to interesting quantum systems. That's another big field that is that is slowly starting to pick up, and applying all sorts of cool stuff. So control theory has really uh, grown a lot in the last century. We are reaping the benefits of that. Another thing that has grown really in the last century is the Moore's law. So thanks to that, uh, we are able to put a lot of computing power in smaller and smaller hardware, and that makes it uh, exciting because with these two things, you could start envisioning things like distributed uh, multi-agent systems. Like that is what I specialize in. So you could think of swarm robotics, as it's commonly called, or distributed multi-agent robotics, where these are robots that are autonomous. They are interacting with the environment they could either modify the environment or you know look at things uh, they are sensing and they have sensing and communication capabilities these do not have a centralized controller so so they're not like you know all reporting to one boss and just roam, roaming around like drones they they genuinely have uh, individual cognition just like you know what we humans do and uh, hopefully uh, many other animal species do and then we have these robots can cooperate with each other so this thing of, of of robots living with each other is called swarm intelligence, and that's that's kind of what I like to work on. Uh, why would we want to put swarm robotics in space? Because there are a lot of applications that we have seen where it's almost impossible to do with large monolithic systems. So you have seen the, the standard trajectory that most space robotics platforms uh, that exist today, most spacecraft, they're huge, big spacecraft that you know, do one thing. They do it very well, no doubt, but they're usually one big monolith. And they're great for most applications, but uh, they're not the best for a large number of applications. And I'll, I'll talk about those applications. I'll, I'll show what what new things you could achieve with, uh, with multi-agent systems. Uh, they have this, multi-agent systems and swarms have this property of robustness. That is, you can you can remove a few of them, add a few of them, their scalability, you can add like millions of them and they work. And they are also flexible. You can make them do interesting, uh, move them their objective from one thing to another thing, and they'll actually work very easily. So here are some potential applications. Before that, I'll talk of a simple uh, swarm aggregation video that I have worked on during my uh, during my PhD. That is how to make Taj Mahal using say a million agents or so on. So this is this kind of trying to say both what interesting structures you could make in space using swarm and also they are so they're so amenable you know like you we genuinely are at the cusp, cusp of technology where if if someone could create this kind of hardware for me i could build interesting structures in space and you're starting to see this uh, in the real world and we'll talk about that so i thought a good idea uh, for this talk at least for people who are interested in robotics would be to so what kind of space robotics platform or missions are possible using uh, multi-agent systems? I know it's rather you know, narrow, but given this is a talk on my career, I thought this is what I specialize in, I could talk about it. Um, the first one is network planetary exploration teams. So think of when the first humans landed on the moon. We sent like a few humans, they walked around here and there and came back. Now, when we send uh, robots to Mars, like the Perseverance rover, robot, uh, rover that will go, the 10th rover to go to Mars, it's still one system. So the big, big issue is that that robot can be only at one point at one time. And, but what we are also doing is sending these helicopters, a Mars helicopter. So this Mars helicopter could also go scout other regions while this one big robot is, uh, is spending time taking science measurements at one location. This helicopter could fly around other places and scout for interesting science target, and then look at you know ten different targets and say this target is the most interesting. Let's send a rover there. So that's immediately what you could achieve with multi systems. Another thing that we could achieve is you might have these caves, and caves are very interesting because that's where we 
hope things might be hidden and surviving even though you know in the marsh martian atmosphere they might not die or they might die because of the radiation or they might die because in the, say in a moon atmosphere in the in the lunar surface there is the, the surface is not very nice for human or for an so you could think of inside the caves we want to go and explore but then you need a number of them to both relay information to the main you know ground station that is communicating with earth or you could lose a few of these once they go into inside the cave and get stuck you know certain reason so here are some examples of stuff that we have been building we are building stuff like this this puffer robot which is uh, very cool it's it's this really small thing that uh, that can fold itself you could pack like 10 of these inside one robot and when the robot say a, a big robot like the mars rover or this lander when it's find something interesting it could just drop one and that these robots could set up a chain and move around uh, i work specifically on developing algorithms for exploration on these robots you can read up more about these robots online so there is one class of problems that i'm looking at another class is uh, another class of problems that i am interested in is you have these main rovers landing on mars but what if after the main rover has landed we could also release this small you know really small agents so kind of deploying a swarm if you like uh, these agents would go and land on other regions on mars and there are a lot of such ideas out there in the literature that people have looked at and i i since i specialize in control that i could i i like to figure out how do how would we release them so that they go and make a nice big formation on ground and they could they could get a lot of interesting science data this data is hard to get using a single robot because say i'm inter- i'm interested in the wind data of on the lunar on the martian surface if if i have only one robot rover sitting i only get one location but if i have a large swarm sitting on the martian surface and i get both a spatial uh, map of the wind data at different location and i get a temporal map uh, because with time all these agents are also collecting the same so using a very simple thing like you know, a bunch of robots carrying just a very simple wind measurement instrument we can get a very high much higher resolution map of what the martian surface looks like and these distributed sensor networks are very available are available on earth and that is how we measure most of the of the important uh, weather and climate parameters that we measure on earth and we want to do that for other planets um the second class of missions that we have been looking at are distributed approaches now this is where uh, these are the class of missions that cannot be done using a single spacecraft uh, and the reason for that is as follows like if you had a single say a single telescope uh, its resolution is limited to the diameter of the telescope but if you have a large swarm say like this of multiple telescopes then the resolution of the image that you get or in essence uh, if you like yeah I, roughly speaking the magnification of the image that you get is equivalent to the entire distance from this telescope to this telescope so it it increases man and, and we are talking of like kilometers of distance over here between telescopes so from a resolutions of say tens of meters you could get to kilometers of uh, resolution using this method this method is called interferometry it's very widely used on earth and we want to apply this uh, for space and there are a lot of technical challenges to make this happen so but the cool part is if this is successful and maybe it might be successful in my lifetime we would be able to take pictures of extrasolar planets like you know the planets that we are just discovering that these are all habitable planets that we could potentially there could be life we could genuinely actually take pictures of those planets with these methods it's fascinating the kind of science you can do with these things and i w- that's why we are all excited about working on this in particular i work on a uh, i work on many missions connected and this is one i'm i'm talking about uh, what we are trying to do in this this uh, project is essentially you know disperse these uh, small granules it's called an orbiting rainbows concept we disperse these small granules and uh, using a bunch of uh, if you like you know laser actuators on the on one side you could give them whatever shape you like and you could give them the shape these small granules could get the shape of say a telescope and then you have these large floating granular telescopes in space and these telescopes could generally you know do what we just talked about do interferometry uh, take very large scale pictures uh, 
other ideas that we could use multi agent systems are spacecraft constellations and convoys. This is something that is used again heavily on Earth. We have this convoy, convoy called the A train, which is a bunch of spacecraft coming one after another that take pictures of the same space on Earth, or same region on Earth. And then you have this all these great climate data that comes out of that. We could do the same thing for you know, all the other planets that we go to. So this is an asteroid and you could have a convoy or a constellation spacecraft around the asteroid collecting interesting data. Um, here is a project that I work on where we are trying to figure out orbits around asteroids that both help in collecting signs in a, in, a, in a quick and efficient manner and sending this data back to Earth very, very quickly. So we are basically, this is a large scale optimization problem that we're trying to understand and help. So the hope is some days, someday in the future, we could, instead of launching this big spacecraft like OSIRIS-REx, that is currently around the asteroid Bennu or Hayabusa 2, which is uh, around, the, which is also around an asteroid. Uh, we could launch these much smaller, low cost asteroids. And then these asteroids could then, uh, sorry, these missions could then collect a lot of data. Another interesting thing about asteroids that's commonly missed out uh, is that uh, take if you're interested in studying the evolution of solar system, uh, you have eight planets, right? And the eight planets have a few uh, satellites like the ones Ashish showed. They have significantly good, good science information. But most of the planets have seen a lot of wear and tear thanks to the atmosphere and climate on those planets. Whereas these asteroids were created almost at the beginning of the solar system. And because they don't have any atmosphere or anything, they are more or less untouched. So if you go and study these asteroids, you end up getting a glimpse of the solar system at the time when it was just beginning. So they are like great time capsules of you know what happened in the solar system, say multiple billions of years ago, four or five billion years ago. So that's why we are very interested in studying different planetary bodies for different reasons. Um, and the last, class of uh, of missions that you could do is multi-robot construction is like all the, the previous three were all based on science general gathering science the last one is let's build big stuff on another planet so here are some ideas that people have been looking at uh, to build uh, structures on the moon um, here is a mission that i i lead uh, that where recently we got this award from nasa called nyack uh, but the idea is we want to put a telescope on the far side of the moon. And why the far side? Because uh, Earth creates a lot of noise in radio because of your televisions, your mobile phones, the satellites, everything is creating noise in radio. But it turns out we don't really know what exists in radio waves frequency above 10 meters or more because the ionosphere really corrupts that signal uh, when it comes close to Earth. The Earth's satellites and all create a lot of noise, so we can't observe that signal when we are outside or near Earth orbit. So we have to go to a place which is right on the opposite side of the moon. So this is Earth, this is moon, and we want to put a satellite right on the opposite, so that's the far side of the moon. And over there, the moon will shield this telescope from all the Earth noise, and we'll be able to observe all these interesting signals that will be coming from space. Humanity till date does not know how the universe looks like at, at wavelengths 10 meter or more. And this mission might be like one of the first missions that would reveal that picture. And why are we interested in that? Because that picture is the picture of what happened in the Big Bang. Between the, the Big Bang, which is, this is like barely, you know, um, a few days after the Big Bang, to like the first stars when they were created 400 million years ago. So this region of what happened, how the first stars look and all can be observed using this telescope. Um, there is a concept of uh, redshift that is, that, is, that is very deep here. So I'll not go deep, deeper on the technical details as to how this happens. But this is clearly a construction project on the moon, right? And it, we're going to build something. And, and my claim is we can build them using these small robots sitting here called axles. And uh, that's it, autonomous to build this thing on the moon. Uh, so that's it. Thank you from my side. Uh, this is a small introduction about what we have been doing. Uh, and now we are happy to take it. Uh, thank you, Ashish and Satrishi. So uh, 
we have questions both uh, some people have just asked on the chat and we also shared a form earlier where we had some questions so one question which i see both here and uh, also in the form and we got a little bit idea from your both your journeys but uh, every, like there are people who like to know how to go about what to do in their current undergraduate years so that they get into space robotics in future maybe i'll start with that given i have the straighter approach uh, my take is if your interest first first before that let me just ask one question before that be very careful what you invest your life in uh, ask yourself are you passionate about space robotics because uh, for most things uh, it requires a lot of hard work and it requires a lot of dedication for most of the missions i just showed today we are not going to see them launching for at least 20 years i'll be very lucky if i get to see those missions in space before i die so that's the trade off in space robotics i want to put that out very clearly okay so if you are passionate about space robotics uh, so find your passion that was the point here find your passion but now if you are passionate about space robotics i would say having a very good background in air matters like like what is earth science what is uh, what is uh, ast astrophysics why do the why do we care about these all these sciences that is important uh, then the third thing i would say is a robotics background is very important uh, so by robotics you could you could think of you know um, i came to the control trajectory of robotics people have always uh, the many people who have built very exciting robots and they have ended and robot especially for uh, extreme environments like build robots that can uh, climb up you know, cliffs or build robots that can go down very deep into uh, very deep into you know the underwater submersible waves that go near the marina trench we have we have people who build robots with, uh, that that have these gecko grippers so they could just touch the surface of almost anything and climb up or move around and up so these are the three main things you need to do if you want to do in space robotics uh, have very core competency in in fields like aerospace and uh, electrical engineering mechanical engineering and all be proficient in the science that goes into these things because end of the day no one's actually going to uh, no one actually let, let me reword that if you don't care about the science of going into space chances are that you won't really find space robotics very very exciting robotics itself is very exciting and you can do a lot of other things like you know autonomous cars or build uh, build these large uh, systems in amazon warehouses which are also robotics right so if you care about space robotics you need to understand why the science of space matters uh, or space science matters and, and be really excited about it and that and a background in how we get in, involved in space sciences the third one is be proficient in robotics not having just a, just a background knowledge actually be you know the, the the stuff ashish pointed out these are some of the main areas on robotics that he sees around it and i rec i agree with that so be proficient in at least a few of those skills because that's what you'll be you will have to use to make your career in these fields go ahead go ahead yeah ashish would you like to add something no i think that basically covered it and yeah i would just say the same thing that as i mentioned there are many different paths into getting into robotics in general so whether you want to focus on the alg algorithmic side of it so maybe more of a cs uh, viewpoint or more on the uh, vision and perception side of robotics or you could be someone who's very much into mechanical engineering like designing grippers and linkages and, and and you know all sorts of clasping mechanism manipulation devices and things like that or you could be someone who's more on the you know machine learning side of things you want to bring some of these modern concepts of uh, machine learning type of approaches into robotics there are many different ways of getting into robotics but if you're specifically passionate about space robotics then i think what really differentiates that is is this kind of aerospace perspective to it like understanding what makes a robot on mars different from a robot operating say in the field here on a farm here um, like 
what what is the space environment look like what do what is the orbital mechanics look like what are some of these scientific uh, challenges or uh, that we are trying to address with the robotics so i think some of those additional pieces of information that you get from an aerospace background helps but as i mentioned there are just many many different ways of getting into the field of robotics or, or space robotics in general okay so uh, i think just uh, another caveat to the same similar question would be how to get to nasa which i think again many people have asked either for internships or like you are working at jpl so if as international students because that's definitely and with in current scenario we are even not sure what's going to happen so. yeah so that is uh, that is an exciting and a, and a very i feel very lucky to have reached jpl because uh, so if you go online and see all the nasa centers all the nasa centers except jpl are government agencies which means the moment you get hired at any of these nasa centers you become a government employee and like any country india also has this rule other than citizens no one can be a government employee so unless you are a us citizen or a us person a us person is someone who holds a green card you cannot be a government employee so most people like us who are like i am a foreign national right now and so is ashish we we can't work in any other nasa center jpl has this interesting style, interesting story that jpl was first a uh, lab created at caltech in the 1936 to build rockets so that's why jet propulsion so they were first building propulsion and then they were building jets and that's why the jet propulsion lab although we don't do either much now we don't we have nothing to do with jets now to the best of my knowledge uh that subsequently when nasa was built after uh so why were they built that's that's actually quite interesting uh they were students at caltech who were working with propulsion and then they were making explosions propulsion explosion happens all the time right and then the administrative at caltech the administrators at caltech said instead of just throwing them away they said okay we have this land very far away from the campus it's in a mountain just go and make your stuff over there so that's how the lab started i find that very exciting because that shows how our institution wants to support research and innovation in spite of the obvious risk to life and limb that is something like being capable of taking rise this is something that is very important for this i i point that out because there have been a bunch of such events in in iit and that have not gone back so just putting it out there uh, then around 1950s uh, when sputnik was launched uh, us decided that they wanted to build something like a space space agency that's where they built nasa at that time, they went around asking all these big labs to join NASA. But Caltech was like, we are already making lots of money from JPL because it was building rockets and all. In fact, the first rocket, uh, first sorry, the first satellite launched by US was made at JPL. So they're like, we don't want to sell JPL to US government. So that's how they ended up in a in a partnership where JPL is managed by Caltech, but it is funded by NASA. So we come under this thing called FFRDC, Federally Funded uh, Research and Development Center. What that means is technically we are not government employees. We are employees of Caltech and Caltech is a private organization. So this is a very long story to essentially say that because we are employees of a private organization, we can be foreign national and still work in JPL. So that's the only reason why we ended up working at JPL. Uh, it's not, not to say that other NASA centers don't have any foreign nationals. They have a few, but they join as contractors. Uh, I can hear a lot of uh, noise, I think, from Roth. Yeah. So, so, so JPL is one of the few places in the world where foreign nationals are very welcome. Now, the next thing is, how do you get there? Uh, for most foreign nationals to enter JPL, internships are very hard to get in. When I was doing my PhD, the rule was that we could still get internships in JPL. Now the rule has been even tightened under the tightened under the new administration, and it's almost impossible to get internships in JPL, which, which are funded by JPL. There is an there is a strategy which is called JVSRP. I will uh, find the link and put it on the chat over here, where if a student has a, a 
scholarship which is given by some other you know organization we get a lot of students from say european countries who come this way uh, if the student has a scholarship on their own which pays for their internship at jpl and jpl does not have to put up any money then they can come to jpl to do a, a internship i know this is not, not fair uh, but this is the only way to do an internship so just putting it out there and it has to be a recognized scholarship it can't be like my parents gave me a scholarship to to play to work at it it has to be something that that they can point look i got this scholarship and this scholarship allows me to do an internship anywhere in the world i would like to do an internship with apl so that method works um you should talk to your uh, you know professors and also talk see what kind of scholarships are available across india especially you know the the uh, private institutions are giving a lot of scholarships in india to play you should see if that that method works if you want to work at jpl my strongest suggestion would be get a phd because without a phd almost like we have a strength of 6000 people and i would say more than 50% have phds so get a phd then get a get a post doc at jpl because chances are you can't get in without a post doc you have to first get a post doc at jpl and then if you can prove you are sufficiently capable jpl will choose to hire you and that's been the route both i have taken that's the route that ashish has taken and that's the route that most foreign nationals i know in jpl work i have taken yeah ashish no i think that's perfect that's the that's the best answer so yeah so do 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 a, do a phd and hopefully during your phd itself you start building contacts and relationships with people at jpl and that you can then materialize to get a post doc at jpl and then use that post doc to get a full time position at jpl so it's not easy i would say we are we both been very lucky and things have worked out for us that we've ended up where we've ended up uh, but there are a lot of challenges involved because of being foreign national so just keep that in mind i just posted the jvsrp link so people can look check it out okay just a small okay. announcement from itc side we will be releasing our feedback forms so please uh, as you can see roshni has pub, uh, published a form please fill that thank you uh so you sent it to only uh as a personal chat to someone because it's not in the chat right now i'm sorry i'll just check okay okay so uh roshni we can move forward uh, yes yeah, sure okay so uh uh another question which uh, many people have asked is uh, currently how is like or not maybe i am not sure about whether they want to ask currently or previously but how is your a uh, general day at work and like, what goes about when you are working around go well you go first yeah Okay, I mean, in general, um, JPL specifically, at least, is a very early morning place. Uh, uh, if you show up at work after eight o'clock, after eight a.m., you probably will not find parking on campus. You have to park like ten minutes away, and then like walk like pretty far. You have to like park on top of a hill and then walk down and do all that. So you have to really get used to a really really early morning schedule. um so yeah, I, i mean i usually show up somewhere around 8 8:30 am uh, or so i mean it's given all those uh, late night habits from iit days it's hard to wake up that early but we somehow manage but um yeah, it really depends on your seniority level at jpl uh, like for instance i only i only joined jpl like i was initially a postdoc and i only became a full time employee like less than a year ago and so uh, i work on limited number of projects just a couple of projects right now so i am lucky in the sense i probably have like a couple of meetings in a day related to my projects and then i get to spend most of the rest of my time actually doing work 
uh, and the other good thing about JPL that I personally like a lot is that it very much feels like a research organization. It's like it's like a university without classes and, and lectures and students and all those things. So there are always talks going on. Uh, there are invited speakers. So it's actually a great place to continue learning, uh, expanding uh, your un like understanding of various different fields. So even though I don't work in propulsion, for instance, if there is an interesting talk on propulsion, I'll go and attend it. So those things happen uh, during the day as well, which is also quite nice. But in general, I do know that JPL is a very meeting heavy place. So I know quite a few people end up spending quite a lot of their time on meetings. I mean, specifically, I will say my project is both hardware and software related. So I usually just sit in the lab where the robots are. Even if I'm working on the software stuff, I typically tend to stay in that room. And there will be days when I'll be just developing the software for quite some time. And then there will be days when I'm just debugging the hardware or implementing the algorithms on the robot and collecting data uh, and working with other people. Yeah, I guess that's my simple take on what a day is like. So yeah, I, I have a slightly different take. Uh, I've been around the JPL for three years as a full-time employee and one year before that as a postdoc. Um, I, I live a bit far away from JPL, so I usually drive in early morning. I reach by seven. Um, yes, what Goel said is very, very true. We have a lot of meetings, but, uh, but usually there is the option that if you don't really like a meeting and then it's, it's becoming a waste of time, chances are those meetings will be distant. One of the thing I really like in JPL is I've seen people care a lot about every hour, every minute, what they're doing, because we have this concept of work for nine hours and then no one no one cares what you do you leave and people will not trouble you on the other hand on those nine hours everyone is at peak efficiency that's that's very nice because uh, you see people working very hard for nine hours and then they leave and uh, because of that we have this every alternate friday off which is called an rdo because technically we are supposed to work 40 hours a week so since everyone works nine hours every day so they work nine hours for uh, one full week, five five days in a week, and then the next week they work for four hours, and they have already worked more than eighty hours in two weeks. And so the next five days off, so alternate Fridays are off, which are which is great. The second thing uh, I would say is uh, I spend a lot of time interacting with scientists, interacting with fellow colleagues, in uh, thinking about where should we push the current state of the art. What should be the next like, what should be the next big things that we should try to tackle? And the reason for that is uh, chances so so we all, as Goel said, we are a uh, you know research institute heavily. Uh, chances are, of course, we have these big missions like perseverance, the March 2020 mission, perseverance, and the Europa Clipper mission. These are all big missions, which means they have been given huge chunks of money, like billions of dollars by the Congress to JPL to enable those missions. But those missions are already at the forefront of technology. They're using the cutting edge technology that was built like a decade ago. So we have to build that new technology so that a decade from now, a new mission would come to us. That's what Ashish has been doing, you know, building the infrastructure so that a decade from now, we could envision a mission to Europa uh, or a decade would be very nice. On more, a, a lander on Europa, you know, something that lands on Europa. So similarly, there are such open questions in almost every field that we need to build a technology so that someday we could think of a mission to go and do that. Like I talked about uh, building interferometers in space. There are so many open questions in that world, even right now. Although people have been investing in that field for the last 30 years. And we will keep doing that for quite a long time. So, so getting to know where the current state of the art in technology is, not just at JPL, but across the world. Then figuring out where should we be investing in and how should we get the money to you know, do that kind of research. That does drive a lot of the work that we do, a uh, lot of the meetings that we have. Another classic reasons to have lots of meetings are uh, the talks that Ashish talked about. There are both talks open to the general audience, then there are talks to much smaller communities who are you know, kind of, if you like, these are communities of excellence where people 
get together and keep pushing one field uh, like we have we have such such communities uh, many of them i am part of a few of them uh, and a third third reason why you would have meetings is if you are part of multiple projects so i usually in a, in a year i usually at any one point of time i'm looking at three to four projects i'm either working or heading three to four projects and, and uh, each of them would have at least one weekly meeting where we keep update or where we keep track of our progress um yeah so so, so there is a lot of meetings there's a lot of uh, interaction with colleagues but it's all very nice one of the things that i want to point out like you know meetings are kind of put down a bit scarily that you know there's be there'll be a lot uh, like people would just go and be like this is just a waste of time or as jaspal bhatti once had a had a comic show where he was like let's have a meeting to discuss the agenda for the next meeting uh, but uh, our meetings are very work driven where we have these things called working meetings where people would generally bring out their problems and if it isn't one hour we'll solve it or uh, we'll be like this is where i'm stuck how do we fix this if it's fixed in 10 minutes that's it the meeting's over and then we go and continue our work so it's very efficient and i would say a lot of that is thanks to the fact that while at work people are efficiently doing the work and then once they leave they just have it fun and no one usually it is frowned upon to take work home and all the culture is get your work done while you're at work Okay, uh, so uh, I will move to a few of technical questions. So uh, there is one question that uh, to specifically to uh, Ashish, I think that uh, do we already have electronic or internal hardware capabilities for technology to survive in extreme environments uh, like Europa? If yes, then why the extreme environment is even a challenge? So it's a very good question, and Sapesh, you should correct me if I'm wrong. But I don't, I don't think we have all the solutions yet. So typically, if you look at an electronic component that you buy from the market, if you look at its temperature ratings, it will say from my, uh, it will work from minus forty degrees to plus eighty five degrees Celsius. Now, if you go and look for some special military grade components or some special application components. automotive grade components and things like that you might find something that goes down to minus 60 or maybe even minus 80 celsius but we are talking on europa for temperatures as low as minus 190 degrees celsius so your typical electronics are not going to work unless you provide them with uh, a thermal environment that keeps them in an operational temperature range so so i guess with electronics I don't think you are going to try to invent brand new transistors and brand new like you know processors that can work when the entire processor is going to get submerged down to those temperatures. So you'll probably just try to provide an optimum thermal environment so that they stay in a reasonable operating temperature range. I think the more the bigger area where research is being carried out for Europa mission right now is even simple things like motor work necessarily very well at very low at at those extremely low temperatures so how do how do we make actuators and other things which we might be concerned about uh, work at those temperatures i mean honestly to to be really honest i'm not uh, really an expert in this field because but i do know there is an entire division within jpl that's actively doing research on cryogenic systems both cryogenic mechanical and cryogenic electronic systems specifically for the environments that you encounter on europa and enceladus and in fact they very recently commissioned a chamber which is big enough that they can put like lots of instruments in there and maintain a temperature of around 90 kelvin for a long period of time and in vacuum so that they replicate the conditions on those objects and see how their various subsystems are performing so it is still it is still a very important challenge and i guess the other aspect of why it's an extreme environment is the radiation environment it's just such an intense radiation environment that you have to design your electronics and other things in such a way that you can either handle it or you just design your mission to basically be complete before the radiation actually increases the likelihood of the death of your mission i'll 
I'll add a little more to that. I mean, the word extreme environment itself is very uh, open-ended, right? So what is an extreme environment? So let's let's take three examples. The one that Ashish just spoke of, Europa surfaces. It's a very cold environment, which is which has high radiation. And uh, that is not the same as, say, what the Juno spacecraft is doing when it is around this uh, around Jupiter. It is in an extremely radiation heavy environment, but it is out. It's a spacecraft rotating around or orbiting Jupiter, so it can use solar panels to kind of keep itself warm and you know generate lots of lots of like lots of energy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Parker Solar Probe is right now going to the sun, so that's an extremely hot environment, extremely radiation intense environment. So that's a very different class of problems. Over there. So Parker Solar Probe is on its way to the to the sun right now, and they had to build a very different class of instruments and technology for it. On the other hand, we want to build, uh, you know, infrastructure on moon. So we have the capability to put something on the moon that might survive for a day or two. Uh, that's what the lunar missions have done. That's what most of the most of the missions that have gone to moon, uh, I mean, on the surface of moon, have been able to do. But moon has these very large temperature swings from like uh, almost uh, plus. Uh, 120, 130 degrees centigrade to minus, minus 100 degrees centigrade over its entire lunar day. You know, moon has 15 days of uh, lunar day and 15 days of lunar night. Earth days, 15 Earth days of lunar day and 15 Earth days of lunar night. So, uh, so that's a very different class of uh, temperatures you have to handle. And the radiation environment is different. So, and then comes the last part, which is does all of the existing technology fit in the form factor that you want to build? So I talked of uh, robots that want to go inside caves. Now that robot somehow has to survive this temperature gradient, but still has to be small enough that it can go inside a cave and explore. And uh, it's it's not obvious how you would do that. In fact, so that so I I would say extreme environments is as open based on where you want to go. And based on that, you have to build a technology to, to make that happen. And we are just scratching the surface on that. So that's going to be a very, very big challenge in this 21st century, building robots that survive extreme environments for space. Yeah, uh, so, and uh, I think it's also not just about the particular electronics or hardware everything needs to work together as well we can't have an like if we have a transistor which can work in that extreme environment but as you said that we need to see about the size and the uh, everything needs to come up together and then it's not about just the one hardware which needs to work okay so uh then there is a uh, 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 one question like you mentioned a lot of missions so uh can you explain a little about the uh, new Perseverance mission, which will be launched this in this next month? Ashish, you want to go? Sure. So it's going to get, at least right now, the launch date is July 22nd. So we'll all have our fingers crossed for a successful launch. So Perseverance rover, uh, it's, it's in many ways uh, similar to the Curiosity rover uh, in terms of, you know, the chassis and the size of the vehicle and all that. It, of course, has some more upgraded instruments, some better science instruments for science investigation. But I would say the main purpose of this mission, and most of you might know this, is to collect samples from the surface of Mars and put them in sample tubes. And to put a bunch of all these sample tubes in a dedicated location on the surface of Mars. So it's going to land in a place called the Jezero Crater. So it's going to go around the crater and it's going to do some investigation. So it has a bunch of instruments like it has X-ray spectrometers and all sorts of instruments like this, which it is going to use to analyze the surface, analyze the rock samples, and whatever it thinks is, is worthy of uh, bringing back to the surface of the Earth. It's going to put collect in a sample tube, and it's going to bring and it's going to put those sample tubes in a specific location. So it has like three different types of drill bits. So the first drill bit is just going to abrade the surface, so you can look at what's happening beneath the surface. And then it has something called a coring bit, which can go and actually core out a sample from the surface, 
and then you put the scored out sample inside a sample tube and then you deposit that sample tube on the surface and the understanding is that this is a very long process but after this mission we will either us or the european space agency we are still negotiating that will launch a rover called a fetch rover which will actually collect these samples and launch them into space and so they will put them in an orbit around mars then we will send another mission which will go and collect that sample from that orbiter around mars and then re-enter the earth's atmosphere and bring it back to the surface of the earth so the samples will probably not come back to earth for a very very long time but at least we are starting the process of bringing the samples back to the earth and as Saptarshi alluded to in his presentation, there are a couple of new exciting things happening on this mission. One is the Mars helicopter. So this will be the first time an object will fly anywhere outside Earth. Uh, so we are super excited about that. Uh, it's, a, it's just a, a, a demonstration mission. So it's not it doesn't necessarily have any science objectives right now. And it's not going to fly very far because it completely relies on the rover for communicating back to the Earth. But it will try to fly for like maybe a hundred, hundred or two hundred meters, and then come back to the rover. And we are very, very excited about what applications it opens up in the future if it's successful. And since I also saw a question in the chats about computational resources, I'll just mention that the Mars helicopter is probably flying the most advanced processor that's ever flown in space. It's flying a Qualcomm Snapdragon 801, which is basically the processor which was in like Samsung Galaxy S5. A smartphone a few years ago. So, I mean, considering that space missions typically tend to fly like really, really outdated processors, JPL really went aggressive with its approach of flying like a really capable processor with this mission. And the other exciting thing about this Perseverance rover is that it also contains an instrument called MOXIE, which is going to try to make oxygen out of the carbon dioxide which is present in the Martian atmosphere. I mean, it's not going to produce a whole lot, uh, but it's just, again, a demonstration mission for, you know, future in-situ resource utilization type of operations where you're trying to make use of Martian resources to your advantage. So there's a lot of exciting things to look forward to with the Perseverance Rover. Yep, I have nothing to add. I just posted two links to these uh, Perseverance Rover and the Mars helicopter. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's this uh, question that uh, who are the brains behind designing any space mission with uh, not uh, like actual, I think they want to say, I will read the question, who are the brains behind designing any mis space mission? I'm not asking about who designs this stuff, but who decides the story and how the spacecraft's life is going to be and its purpose. And Basically, I think who defines the mission. Right. Uh, Ashish, should I take that? Yeah, go for it. So, this is actually the story of how a space, the evolution of a space mission. So, it might not be the same person. Okay, that's the first part. Uh, different people come in and go out in different part of time. And it also depends on the class or the size of the mission. So let's take something big like, say, uh, Perseverance rover, because that's the largest class of missions that we deal with, or you know, the missions that will fly to moon. There, usually, it all starts off with a bunch of really big shot scientists uh, who, who found they write these things called decadal surveys. They say that we need a mission, but by who's written? Decadal surveys are available online. If you just search for this word decadal survey, you'll see decadal survey for each of the different sciences. So this is a group made of the best scientists across USA and usually also have lots of international scientists in them. Uh, they sit down and say, this should be the focus of US space for the next decade. And usually they call out like, we think a mission to Mars that has, uh, that does these, these, these things would be beneficial. And usually those are called, you know, these, these big flagship missions. They are given to each of the NASA centers and they're told, okay, you have to build this. So in this particular case, the idea, the story of the mission came from the group body of scientists Then it went to NASA. NASA decided this, we give KPL the job to build this mission. And then KPL then 
appoints a bunch of team and they start designing for it. So that's one class of missions. Another class of missions, like the really small class of missions, like you know the Marco CubeSat, that the first CubeSat that went to uh, Mars. Uh, that was a bunch of bunch of engineers who were like, you know, we know how to build small sats. Maybe we could send a small sat to Mars. And then they went around and, and it was uh, handed, headed by Andrew Klesch and a bunch of other people at JPL. They went around and advocated for this idea. JPL invested in them. They got funding from NASA and then they built that uh, spacecraft. And then it flew to Mars along with the last Curiosity rover. So there are multiple views, ways in which these things happen. But the one thing I, I would say is if someone's building a smaller class machine, like you know, tens of millions of dollars, then it would usually be the same set of people who go through all the phases. So we have a we have some phases before the mission starts, uh, which is design phase, if you like. You all, you all have done design, right? Uh, so you kind of have an idea of how the design cycle goes. Pre-design, during the entire design cycle, and then I don't want to use the technical terms here. And then once those like the stuff that goes to launch. So there are there are people who, if it's a smaller phase mission, usually the same set of people do the entire stage, entire cycle, design cycle. If it's a huge mission, like a flagship mission, then usually it's different sets of people who come in and go out at different sets of times based on their speciality and skill. Um, I currently work on the world of pre-design. That is, we come up with concepts and ideas, and then if it gets picked up in the in the design phase and gets funded to become a mission, and other people come in and do that part. Uh, I might choose to do that later in my life to build a, to have my own, you know, be involved more in a mission. Uh, so it it depends on a person's interest on where they want to be because the, the things are very different. So like I like to think of ideas, whereas the person who's in who's in charge of launching Perseverance is heavily looking at his budget, looking at the timetable, and making sure all the you know, all the fires are put down and making sure this. It's a very different class of problems. Like people who have done sat like would understand the differences between these different class of uh, or or any interesting large project would understand it differences between the different class of problems that arise in different stages of a design cycle. Yes, so uh, Ashish, do you want to add something? No, I think that uh, basically covers it. And the only, yeah, the most awesome thing, as Saptar, she just mentioned, is this whole planetary decadence survey process. Uh, um, or this, so actually, for the next decade, what missions should be the priority for NASA? They're starting the process for it right now, and they're going to come up with a decision in 2022. So you can imagine how seriously they take this process. They are going to collect inputs from as many sources as possible. They're going to collect all the biggest scientists and engineers in the US, uh, and they're going to collect inputs from people. In fact, Saptarshi and I are submitting a paper like giving input and recommending to them like, hey, you think we should you should fund a mission like this in the future. So they invite inputs from the entire broad scientific community, like from all sorts of researchers anywhere in the world to provide inputs on what should NASA do in the next 10 years. And by I think we are really proud and we are happy of this like process that it is so collaborative and where they take as many people's inputs into consideration as possible before deciding what is done. I, I just posted a wiki link to the decadal surveys from where you can look at all the decadal. All of this is online, by the way, online and open to everyone in the world. Uh, from there, the thing I saw missing on the decadal surveys is there's also a heliophysics decadal survey that is missing on the Wikipedia link. So any of you and wiki enthusiasts will add that link and add all that subsequently. Okay, so uh, there's one question that how do we uh, plan to collect data like percentage of ice and volatiles in the planetary shadow regions in the lunar south pole? That's very specific. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, the, so the question there is, it seems based on some data that we are getting that there might be some lunar ice hidden in the South Pole regions because the South Pole has this interesting property that there are a bunch of craters and because the South Pole almost never gets the sunlight on it, 
there might be ice in, hidden inside the craters, which are called permanently shadowed regions because they never see any sunlight. Uh, so there, there is a hope that we can find ice over there. Uh, if we find ice, ice is a very good propulsion device. So because you could get hydrogen and oxygen from ice and by electrolysis, and that becomes your, your fuel, right? So uh, if we find ice, that would be a very, very big deal. So that's why many missions are being planned to the south pole of the moon. Uh, I don't think anyone wants to bring the ice back to Earth. If they find the ice, like really find it, uh, right now we just have inferences from, from you know, spectrum data and all that there could be ice. If we really find a lot of ice, then very soon we might end up with a colony over there because that seems to be the right place to build a colony. You have ready access to water. And if the water is electrolyzed, you have ready access to fuel. So uh, that would be a very cool thing to do. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Ashish? No, I don't have anything else to add. Sapesh is the lunar expert these days. <laughs> OK. So there's one way, another specific question that uh, what, according to you, is harder, the control and coordination between a swarm of robots or uh, embodied intelligence within the individual robots? I think we are uh, mute, Satish. Satish, this is for you. Okay, so I don't know. That's that's a wrong question to ask to me. I am of the opinion that you should build really simple individual robots and have all the complexity come out of their interactions. I am not. This opinion is not shared by. 95% of scientists and researchers in the world. But I like that opinion simply because um, that's how I see, you know, all swarms and all human beings and everything behave. I think each individual, say, take, take the locust swarm right now, you know, just put aside the fact that the locust swarm is very bad to human. Just think of their own survival. Each locust swarm is, is just a simple locust. It will die if you just stamp, stamp on it. But together as a swarm, they can achieve crazy things and it's almost impossible to even subdue them, right? And we are seeing famine develop in many parts of Africa because of them. I said, take aside the fact, the human human impact. I, I'm not, I know this is a bad example, but I'm trying to explain my point of view. That individual agents really, uh, their superiority, their individual intelligence might not, uh, is not as strong as the combined effort, combined on the other hand, because we can only send one agent to Mars, that's why we are sending only one Perseverance rover. We can't send tens and thousands of them right now. So it depends on the example, but more or less, I think in the future you would see large mass produce agents with not that much intelligence themselves, but able to cooperate and they can do phenomenal things. So there's one very interesting question, which I, I also liked a lot, that how often do you uh, have to reskill or retrain yourself? Since you are working on multiple projects, you might also have to do work on some preliminary projects where fund, like this, it's a long question, where funding may be pulled part way, or you may have to, like, like, yeah. Do you work outside your doctoral uh, proficiencies? Yes, that's very, very important. I mean, I do that all the time. You can't survive. In fact, that's one of the key points that our, our today's talk is, is about. Like, I, I use very little of the skills I learned in IIT, like the actual, you know, uh, pen and paper skills I learned from the projects in IIT Bombay, uh, because I have moved way far away from what I learned due did during my PhD. And now I've moved way far away from what I did during, learned during my PhD to something completely. So point is, as a point of being on the cutting edge of technology, is that once you have done your research on that cutting edge, chances are that it's no more the cutting edge. Now it's normal. Everyone knows how to do it. So you move somewhere else where 
now that is the cutting edge right so you have to retrain redevelop the skills and uh, more often than not you have to learn something completely new very often uh, i personally believe that the the key fundamentals like maths uh, you know theory like the stuff i talked about graph structures networks control theory the basics don't change because that's the basics that has been developed over centuries of human knowledge but their applications change a lot so like optimi optimization is hot now machine learning is hot now but you know 10 years from now i'm sure people will be looking at something completely different and uh, so these are all applications if you like of the same same skills that we have all that we learn so having a very concrete idea of those skills is is very powerful but uh, you have to reinvent yourself if you want to be in the research world you cannot just hold on to what you learned and not and move on yeah i mean that's perfectly what dr she said in fact i'll even go on to say if i did not have to reskill and retrain i would probably get bored so i think one of the most exciting things about working at jpl is or i mean in any field that you pursue i think what really keeps us going is the fact that you learn new things every day if i just had to use the same skill every day i would probably really get bored of it so this is what keeps us on our toes and we're always looking for a good combination like good projects where you know it, at least we have some specialization in it or some so we can we can contribute in some way to the project based on what we know or what we've learned before but at the same time you get to learn something new as well so like that's just absolutely the truth these days you just like you have to learn new things things like every day like you saw what my thesis project was my phd thesis was on meteoroid and orbital debris impacts on satellites and right now i'm working on like robotic landers for ocean worlds so they are very different but there are like some very critical skills that you carry through simple things like how do you read research papers in a field how do you uh, how do you ask the right set of questions like you know who do you how do you at what point do you go and reach out to a specialist and how do you like you know seek help in areas that you don't know like there are some just very fundamental ways about tackling problems and doing research which really carry over from one project to another but uh, yeah reinventing yourself is like a really important aspect of what we do today uh, if you don't mind i want to pull up a question that was asked what was your cgpa in the institute when you were in the institute this is actually very connected so i don't know i am telling mine i was an 8 point something i don't remember what it was right now actually uh, but the point is that's not what no one has asked me this question that you have asked today in this entire career of last uh, more than a decade now doing multi agent systems and so on cgp is not going to be important it might be important in your application for graduate school but after that what will matter is what skills you genuinely understand we had nine point something pointers who were hugely successful uh over who had huge who are hugely successful today and we have nine point something pointers who are nowhere who might be like not doing anything useful with their lives so don't measure your yourself with cgpa uh, accept the fact that you know cgpa je rank are, are are some metrics that the indians and the world in general has or sat scores for that matter in us have created because we don't have a method to actually go and ask someone how skilled are you but that's that's just a, a a consequence of the way education system has happened if you if you want to educate a million people or tens of millions of people every day you have to somehow you have to do it and somehow you have to quantify it but don't quantify yourself with that Quant identify yourself with what your skills are what your goals are what your ambitions are and then try to achieve those goals and ambitions uh if you are if you are failing yes failures are stepping stones to success uh if you are succeeding keep at it but if you are succeeding all the time that means you are not not really risking yourself you are not really challenging yourself um yeah i mean that's that's a very important thing that i really want to point out to the iitb you know colleagues or or young kids at iitb right now given that i'm a decade old now that 
don't measure your self worth using cgpa i know that is done very heavily and and i'm telling you that's not good but i'm also telling you that it's very hard for a professor to go out and ask you what is the skill that you have that's also not possible right you have classes of hundreds of people so what you can do is you push yourself to a level where you are recognized and uh, that's what you should do aim for the skies become very skillful in what you choose in your own personal goals just because you happen to be in aerospace doesn't mean you have to do aerospace it means you choose something you like and you pursue it and uh, as a secondary note to something that we don't really talk about much uh, in education is you need a support network a peer group who can help you in you know when you are when you are going through failure very often in iit m- most of us are facing failures for the first times in our life when you often might not even face failures in iit they'll go out into the real world and suddenly face failures and they're like oh my god the world is coming crashing down have to learn that failures are a very important part of life and at that time your technical skill is not going to help you when you feel that i am failed what you need is a support network who will remind you that yes i i am capable i am useful and uh, and they'll they'll push you on inspired through your failures and you have to build that like you have to be good people to build that support network be there for each other when the time comes like ashish and i have been together since our first day in iit bombay uh, i uh, my i i met my wife just a, a few months before iit bombay and uh, before joining iit bombay and we have been together for the last 15 years uh, you might find her on the chat haripya uh, you know many of my friends in iit bombay i'm staying in touch with uh, like uh, my ment- my mentee tushar jadav is today uh, building a large you know, very exciting corporation in doing lots of cool tech in india the point here is the support network who are there for you when you have difficulties is very important because you also have to be there for them when they are having difficulty and that's what really drives people to success so so just a one line summary technical brilliance is very important don't hide it with numbers it's very easy to crack a course for some crack an exam for some people it's very hard to crack an exam for some people but technical brilliance cannot be cannot be overshadowed by any any of these numbers you have to have it you have to be really skillful at what you are interested in second thing be a good human get a support network care for people whom you like and everyone will care for each other in life that might be the path to success uh on the similar lines uh what like what different projects apart from satellite of course we were both part of the satellite team like uh, basically what i want to ask is on what uh, how did you decide that you want to go into a research field and uh, what was like apart from that like team were there any other projects you did or something like that ashish did you go for um i mean satellite was i mean I, of course we had the standard btech projects and the btech seminars i don't know if you have still have those things uh but i had my standard btech projects btech seminars in my engineering physics department i mean it's not that i didn't like it i actually applied to every grad school in physics and sanford was the only university that i applied to in aeronautics and astronautics and i got accepted so i was like okay i guess so i actually didn't know that it doesn't really matter what you do your undergrad in so i was worried that oh i have no course work in aerospace so they will not accept me so i applied everywhere in physics and only at stanford i applied in aerospace engineering and stanford accepted me so i went there but uh, i still like enjoyed physics a lot so i did my btech btech seminar and btech uh, btech btech project i also did an internship at iisc when i was there and that was completely in heliophysics like studying sunspots and things like that i was also part of the iitb racing team for a very short period of time i mean these were all new projects that were coming up at iit bombay which was a really exciting time for us i mean i know these are all established institutions now like i mean the iitb satellite team has been running strong for a long time i've heard about the autonomous underwater vehicle team that has done really well in san diego and 
I know IITB racing has gone strong and it's branched off into many different competitions and many different teams as well. So I think these are all like excellent avenues that you all have. Uh, there was also the uh, UMIC uh, or the Innovation Cell sign that used to participate in these international competitions like ASME competitions and Robocon uh, and things like that. And of course, like some of the tech fish projects were really like big projects like people would work on it for people who are building micro mouse would work on it for five six months or so so i think these are all like great projects i mean it's good to start off with some of these like for lack of a better term jugard type of projects where you just get your hands dirty into like playing with motors and switches and leds and things like that but i think it really helped me personally to then graduate to a more structured project like the student satellite project because you really get to practice some very good quality engineering. Like, you know, you set up, you define your requirements, you make CAD models, you make, you, you, you get peer reviewed on your models and your data, and you analyze your performance. You go through a proper engineering design exercise. And that really, at least for me, kind of framed how I approach a lot of things in the future. So for me, uh, I didn't really know I wanted to do research when I joined IIT as a, as a person. I mean, clearly, you know, you, an 18, 18 year old, you're like, this is your field, work in aerospace. You really don't know much. But, uh, so I was doing a lot of robotics as part of building uh, robot, robot cars for Shastra, TechFest and all. Uh, then I, we started working on satellite. While we were working on satellite, uh, it slowly dawned on me the complexities of real world projects and how little we know when we get out as an undergrad compared to where we need to be if we want to really build these projects. So it was immensely clear to me after three years of uh, working on satellite that just a B.Tech or a master's in, a, in aerospace was not enough to, to really solve the big open questions in, in the world. So oh, that's when I was like very excited to do research. I also had a very good experience in uh, doing my master's uh, thesis with Dr. Bandhapadde, no relationship to me in Syscon. And uh, we we worked on, that's my first taste on multi-agent systems uh, with him. And I really liked that experience. And I was like, yes, I can see I need to learn a lot of, so Satellite taught me there is a huge breadth of knowledge that exists out there. And I just, I am, I do not have depth in anything. My master's taught me that I have some depth in control theory, but the actual depth in control theory is huge. And now my PhD taught me I have very high depth in one field that is multi-agent systems and swarms and that to control from control perspective. And how much more the depth is, how much more the breadth is, and uh, how, how, how many different things people are doing. So, so doing a really deep research in one field shows you how little you know about everything else in the world. Uh, whereas doing just an undergraduate in a, in a field, you get the feeling that I know everything. Um, there's, a, there's a common term for this, I, I forget that it, when you know very little about something, you think you know a lot. And then when you know a lot, you like realize you know very little. Uh, there's a very interesting picture that Sarin, sir, Professor Sarin at uh, IIT Physics uses to explain this. He thinks of this as this, if this circle was the breadth of knowledge that exists, your undergraduate, your master's and all is just, you know, inside this circle. This is, this is the circle of all the human knowledge that exists in the world. And during your PhD, you make a small indent on this knowledge curve of humanity, on knowledge sphere of humanity. And then you realize how difficult it is to make a new contribution to the knowledge. And then you also realize how much more there is in the real world that people need to know to make these things. So if you are interested in research, do research. That's the only way you'll need, you'll realize whether you like research or not. Um, on the other hand, if you are not interested in research, uh, if you think uh, industry is your, is your calling, go do internships in industry. Like don't wait till the last year to figure out what should I do. In fact, yeah, don't wait till the last year to figure out what you want to do with your life. It's fine to have a plan in year one of your undergrad and that plan will change drastically by year four. But have a plan. Think about what you want to do. Think about what you care. Don't, don't not do it. Do it. It, it 
will change with time, but still do it. Yeah, yeah I also like always wanted to do a research in astrodynamics field. And and now I apply to everywhere in astrodynamics and only one in planetary sciences and I've gotten the planetary sciences. So let's see how that goes on. So that I get your point and then it gives me a little bit more confidence that yeah, it may work out. So uh, I think we are almost on with the time and uh, I, if you both can, I will just ask one last question that, uh, what advice would you like to give for robotics startups or space startups in near future? Maybe, okay, I'll start. So firstly, I'm on the space side. I'm super excited by all the news I've been hearing recently about the Indian government opening up the space sector to commercial companies. I think that's a huge, huge plus. Uh, it would be awesome if ISRO could outsource all the standard work of launching satellites and launching communication satellites, launching Earth observation satellites, and building launch vehicles in general. If it can like delegate that work to private companies and focus on things like Chandrayaan, Mangalayaan, uh, all these other types of missions that really can generate excitement in the country and get people really excited about the space missions in the future, I think it's it's going to be an amazing thing. So I, I would really encourage people who are interested on the entrepreneurial side. Uh, and I'm actually like, even though I was initially not very much interested in that area, I've recently gotten involved with a couple of companies and all. And it's really a different world altogether. It's very exciting. You, of course, have much less appetite for research and fundamental problems. Your goal often is like, okay, what can I do to just like get this product out as quickly as possible and convince my investors that I have something useful. So the motivations are slightly different and you have to make some compromises, but it is a completely exciting world altogether. Uh, there are different challenges that you have to encounter over there. Um, but like, if you are really inclined in this field, I would like strongly encourage you to, to pursue it. And I'm, really excited about all the opportunities that seem to be opening up right now. Uh, I've actually been contacted by quite a few people who are, who have participated in all these different student satellite programs that have been happening around the country and have gone on to start up uh, several companies over here. And, um, and in general, like even robotics in general, I think is, is kind of coming up again as a very uh, exciting field. Because there are a lot of new areas that are opening up with all the autonomous cars and drone delivery systems and uh, like robotic warehouses and things like that. There is a huge demand for robotics people or robotics innovation these days. So I think there are a lot of ways in which you can contribute in this world, either in the industry or on the research side. So I would just encourage you very heavily. And yeah, feel free to experiment by like doing an internship at any of these places. Like one thing maybe we did not get to touch is both of us had a very, I guess, academic life so far where we went from academia to academia. And typically in India, or at least in my undergrad, I think we had a slightly negative impressions of going into industry as if we are permanently committing to industry and moving away from academia. Like I cannot emphasize how many people I've seen in my career, very, very successful people who've had a stint in the industry between their undergraduate and master's and PhD degrees. And in many universities, actually in the US, they actually really value someone who comes from an industry background, both for faculty positions and for you know grad school admissions. Like when you've been in the industry, when you've seen what the real world is like, you really bring in a new perspective altogether. You, uh, you can bring in more contacts, you can bring more context to the problems that you want to work on. So if you're not sure about pursuing research right now, if you're really interested in working for a company, go work for that company, go pursue that right now. Like, don't worry about it. You can always come back to academia. Like there's someone from my year who worked for five years at MathWorks and is now pursuing a PhD in robotics at uh, USC, at University of Southern California. So he worked in industry for five years and then decided, no, I want to go back to academia and he got 
admitted into a pretty reputable program in robotics over there. So yeah, so if you want to go explore the startup world, try something new, totally go for it. It doesn't necessarily preclude you from like pursuing anything you want to do in the future. So to add to that, uh, first I would uh, just point out, Arvind pointed out both the Dunning-Kruger effect I was talking of and a very nice illustration of this concept of what knowledge uh, world, humanities knowledge world looks like. It's, it's in the chat. And obviously, uh, Ashish is uh, very right in all his uh, things. He, he himself is a co-founder of two companies, so he's a great person to contact. Uh, my, my only take with uh, entrepreneurship is, uh, uh, I have I have seen a good number of entrepreneurs building really useful uh, technologies or platforms that are of benefit to humanity. I've also seen many of them build software apps that are just to make money. Uh, I have nothing against making money. It's just that uh, if that is what you personally want to do, but if you personally want to build technologies that help humanity uh, be very careful what you start investing in because it's very easy to raise uh, money through vcs for short term flashy projects it's, it's significantly harder to get money for building say uh, on many many uh, you know really useful stuff but it's harder so if you want to get involved in a hard problem uh, it's harder to raise money for those problems so entrepreneurs have a have a difficult choice, I believe, and be careful of that choice. Uh, the second one is for people who might not be entrepreneurial. Uh, I personally am more of a institutionalist. I like building institutions. I like building organizations that can carry on. For example, satellite group, because each individual is just a small drop in the bucket which goes away. But if you build an institutional change, even after the person is gone, the institutional thing carries on. So if you are so inclined to really make a difference in the, in the long run of history, I would recommend get behind institutional support. Like one of the best ways in India to, to make a big impact is, you know, be part of all these huge organizations that are super successful. Let's throw, become prof, do all these things and then keep at it, you know, build that support or build that institution up to a state of high excellence such that you could actually uh, make a difference. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. Entrepreneurs have a very big role to play. I also feel that other people have a very big role to play. Just don't, you know, don't not do anything. Do something that you genuinely are passionate about. Keep pushing it. Okay. Thank you, Satrishi and Ashish. So we have already 50 minutes more than the intended one hour yeah. slot. So we'll close now. I would like to thank you both for giving extra time. And yeah. uh, also thanks to all the people who have asked the questions. We may have missed a few questions, but sorry. <laughs> so uh, I will give uh it to roshni if there's something she wants to add uh i guess you've pretty much covered it on so thank you all for joining us today i especially want to thank saptarshi and ashish for their talks i'm sure i'm speaking for everyone present here when i say that i have a much more realistic perception of robotics space nasa and how you know different paths can converge to the same goal so uh, also thank you for the links. Uh, we'll be sure to check them out and I can think we can post them from our page as well for the people who are interested. And uh, thank you for being a great audience. We hope to see you in the other talks in this series. Awesome. Thank, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. This was awesome. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.